So you want to start a farm from scratch, even though you work a 9 to 5 job, have limited time and resources, and have limited experience with both the production side as well as the business side of farming. In this video, I'm going to share the exact same 7 step process my wife and I have used to start our farm. In fact, these steps allow us to make a comfortable living on our small farm, and I hope that by the end of this video, you can use this framework to get started in your farming journey. Hey guys, my name is Moreno from DutchFarmer.com. This channel is all about sharing my experiences with farming and showing you ways of how you can transition from your current job and career into making a good living on a small farm. On this channel we're going to cover both the production side and the business side of farming as well as tips, strategies and tutorials. So if this is your first time here, welcome and consider subscribing. Now before I'm getting into the first step, I would like to share that the seven step process I'm about to share with you here is the approach that we used when we started our farm. I'm sure there are many ways you can start a farm, but following this exact process allowed us to identify exactly what crops to grow, the estimated quantities and the actual ideal customers that were going to buy our crops, all before we invested anything else than a little bit of our own time. So with that said, let's jump right into step number one, and this step is all about doing your research. Before you start your farm, before looking at all the different types of tools you're going to need, before preparing your farm for production, creating a design for your farm and a crop plan, and even before you start growing your crops, like do your research. Start by first identifying who your ideal customers are. Find out what they want, how much they want, find out what they're willing to pay for it. Whether you're going to sell your crops at the local farmer's market or to chefs or to local stores or at a farm stand. Having a clear idea of who you're going to sell to and what you will actually grow for them is in my opinion one of the fundamentals when you get started. Too many people start this farm business in the opposite way and they start growing a bunch of stuff and try to get rid of it after they've started growing their initial crops. Usually they follow the advice somewhere in the lines of just grow the stuff you like to eat yourself. And I have to say there is nothing wrong with that if you do it for fun or as a hobby. But from a business perspective and if you want to make a living from doing this you've got to be a little bit more strategic about it you will actually have to go out there and start talking to your potential customers wherever that's possible go to your local farmers markets and look at what other farmers are growing look how much they're growing of specific crops like what do they have at the beginning of each day and what do they have at the end of the day Look at their pricing, their presentation, their customer service and the types of customers they are serving and ask yourself, like, is the demand higher than the supply or is the place saturated? Do they sell imported produce only or strictly farm grown produce? Having a basic understanding of the supply and demand in your area will allow you to start creating a plan of approach. Maybe there's enough room for another vendor at the market. Maybe you can target an underserved audience. Or maybe you can grow crops other farmers do not have for sale, but there's enough of a demand for that makes it worthwhile for you to grow. Also, have a look at the local restaurant scene. Go out there and start talking to some chefs to see whether they would be interested in working with local growers. Ask them what types of crop they're looking for throughout the growing season. Ask them where they get the produce from now and what they're willing to pay for it. How many times per week would they like their produce to be delivered? Having a basic understanding of the demand in your area will allow you to grow towards that estimated demand and not the other way around. Last thing you want is to be in a situation where you have an abundance of a crop where there's no demand for. This way you for sure end up with a very expensive gardening hobby. Having said that, the process to find out about the demand does not have to take you a very long time and is quite straightforward. The way we went about it on our farm was simple. We made a list with all the potential customers in our area within a certain radius of our farm that we were comfortable with to drive and deliver our produce to. We listed down farmers markets, restaurants and local organic grocery stores. And except for the farmers markets which we visited several times to get an idea of the traffic and produce being sold, we contacted each individual potential customers to set up a meeting and to get to know their demands. Doing this beforehand will give you a good idea of what types of crops your potential customers are looking for. From there you can then start creating crop profiles and start selecting the crops you're going to grow. The way we did this on our farm is we looked at the rough estimations of the demand of each individual crop. Once we had these estimates we then started estimating how profitable each 
crop would be in our area based on the yields, days in the gardens and the inputs required to get the crop from seed to finished product. From there we were able to see, based on our rough estimations, which crops would be the most profitable to grow in our area, but also was in line with both the local demand and our financial goals. So if I would have followed the advice of start growing what you like to eat, I would have ended up trying to grow 30 different types of crops and probably 50 different varieties within those crops. That would have been way too much for me to handle at the beginning. When you're just starting out, I recommend you grow anywhere between 15 to 20 familiar crops that you know is a demand for in your area. Get good at growing and selling them, then from there on continue to grow the stuff that sells well and get rid of the ones that don't. But most importantly, verify the demand before you start growing. Step number two, design your farm. This step is all about creating a basic design of your farm. This is a must if you want to create a farm that is well organized and optimized for efficiency, practicality and ultimately profitability. I've spent quite some time working on other farms and it surprised me that many of these farms fail to organize their operations and create a basic design that takes into consideration the day-to-day -day work on the farm. Elements were placed out of context and this caused the farmers and the workers to lose valuable time in the process. Having said that, creating a farm design for a market garden is pretty straightforward. The first step in the design process of your farm is to create a base and sector map. This map contains basically all the existing elements on your land like trees, buildings, fences and things like that. But also outdoor forces like prevailing wind directions, wildlife corridors, potential frost pockets, sun angles during different times of the year and the elevation of your land. The way we did this on our farm was that we simply took the maps from our property, from Google Maps, we got ourselves a nice big piece of paper and we drew in the boundaries of our land including all the elements that were already present on our property. Now you can do all of this with software but I personally like doing this step the old school way with a pencil and a paper. That is not because I like pen and paper so much, it's got more to do with the fact that I don't understand any of the software out there. So to get our drawing on scale we simply went outside to take the measurements with a long measure tape and remember that this step does not have to be 100% accurate. Just make sure that you have the rough measurements and you'll be fine. Once we had this initial map with the boundaries and the fixed elements on it, we needed to include the external forces our land is dealing with. So things like the sun angles, wind directions, elevation of the land, average monthly temperatures and precipitation, frost pockets, uh, potential wildfire areas, flooding areas and so forth. Taking all these things into consideration during the design process will allow you to create a resilient, practical and efficient farm. For example, after evaluating your land and creating the design, you might realize that there's a huge wind tunnel effect on one part of your property that will cause potential problems with the crops you're going to grow there. Knowing this, you can now decide to include wind breaks there so you can reduce the negative effect of the wind on your crops. Or after evaluating your property, you might realize that the lower part of your property is prone to flooding. Knowing this, you can decide to install a drainage system or you could maybe potentially create an irrigation pond on this location. These are small observations to make at the beginning of the establishment of your farm and it doesn't have to take you long to do this. But in the long run, doing this beforehand can and will have a large impact on the functionality of your farm. Then once you've created this first base and sector map, it's time to include some of the fixed elements you're going to need to operate your farm. Chances are that there's already some buildings on your property that could fulfill a function for the farm, like barns and sheds. If not, you'll have to build it from the ground up. On our farm, we identified several key elements we needed for the market garden, including a plant nursery for the growth of seedlings, a greenhouse for heat loving crops and season extension, an irrigation system, a tool shed, a post harvestation, fencing and permanent growing beds. Once we had identified the fixed elements we needed, we used relative placement design to place the elements in such a way that minimizes food traffic and optimizes the day-to-day -day task on the farm. Since our property is small scale and the buildings were already there when we arrived, we simply converted these spaces into a tool shed and a post harvest station. But if this is not the case for you, consider placing these elements centralized on your farm. This will minimize the food traffic and will reduce the time walking back and forth. Another important element on our farm is our high tunnel. As you can see, the land we farm on contains quite some trees, so there was not much space left for us to put it elsewhere than on the north side of the property. When placing a tunnel or greenhouse, consider first what the function of it is. Do you want to optimize it for winter production or for summer production? If you want to optimize it for winter production, the best way to position your greenhouse will be from east to west. This will increase the time the sun shines in the greenhouse with the low winter sun. If your main goal is summer production, place it from north to south. 
This will allow the sun to shine equal hours on both sides of the greenhouse. As for the growing beds, since we're dealing with an old family style orchard here, we had to pay extra attention to the placement of the beds. Since we wanted to create standardized beds, as this will allow for much easier crop planning and materials like fleeces to be of the same length, we had to do quite some puzzling. Next to that, we wanted to make sure to take into consideration the way the water flows on our land. If we put our raised beds on contour, we are potentially creating water capturing systems, referred to as swales in permaculture circles. For the purpose of growing annual vegetables in our temperate climate and with the soils we are working with, I find it's actually best to locate the bed slightly off contour. This will allow the water to slow down, but also have enough time to infiltrate into the soil whilst allowing excess water to run off when necessary. As you can imagine, these requirements in combination with the tree systems we have took us quite a bit of puzzling. But in the end, we've been able to position the beds how we wanted them and it became a nice place to work and be in. These are some of the basic principles we follow to design our small farm and this will give you a broad overview of how you can go about it on your farm. Then we go to step number three. And in this step, we're going to create a basic crop plan. Once you have your basic design ready of your farm and you know roughly how many growing beds you will have, you can now establish a crop plan that will ensure a continuous supply of crops during the growing season. If this is the first time you're going to create your crop plan, it can become quite overwhelming at times. So it's best to take some quiet time when you're well rested so you can focus on the task at hand. The way we plan our crop production is slightly different than other farmers, but the base principles are the same. We need to make sure that we grow enough crops that will allow us to reach our financial goals. So therefore we always start with our financial target as our first step. Once we know how much money we need to make, we can now start breaking this down into a production system that takes into consideration this goal, but also the local demand in our area. With these criteria, we can now proceed to creating our crop plan. The way we do this is we look at all the crops we're going to grow, including the rough quantities we want to have for each crop. We then start writing down every single seeding we need to do to cover the weekly demand, which goes as follows. Let's say that after doing our market research, we've identified that there is an estimated demand of 90 bunches of radishes per week. Once we've estimated the demand, we then need to look at when we can have the radishes available during the growing season using a crop availability list. On our farm, we can have our first crops of radishes available roughly around the 18th of March in our high tunnel. If you don't know when you can have your crops available in your area, talk to some other local farmers and some avid gardeners or look at the recommended seeding times for each individual crops from local seed companies. These can give you good estimations of when you can start planting your crops. So if we can have radishes available on the 18th of March, we need to know their days to maturity. With other words, how long it takes the crop from being seeded to harvest stage. For radish, this is on average 30 days. But since we're very early in the growing season, I would add an additional two weeks to the average DTM. In this case, if we want the radish to be ready for the 18th of March, we'll subtract 44 days from this date to give us our first seeding date, which in this case is February the 3rd. Once we have this date, we'll include this into our crop planning spreadsheet. After we've identified the date, we now need to find out how much we need to grow of it. This is where a crop data sheet will have to be used. This sheet contains all the information you will need per individual crop to help you out during the crop planning stage. At the end of this video, I will share with you a link to our free 7 steps to making a living on a small farm guide that goes hand in hand with this video that includes the crop data sheet we use on our farm, along with a lot of other valuable resources that you can use. Since we've identified a demand of 90 bunches of radishes per week and we know we get on average 50 bunches per bed, we now know that we need to plant two beds of radishes to meet the demand. This we include in our spreadsheet along with the dates. This little exercise we then do for each individual crop we've decided to grow to ensure we can meet the demand from, from our customers. Once we have this foundation of our crop plan ready, we combine all the crops together and we create a planting plan out of it so we can make sure we have enough space to fit in all the plantings and to ensure the exact placements of each individual crop during the growing season whilst also taking into consideration basic crop rotation practices. Once we have the planting plan ready, we take the dates of each individual planting, whether it's direct seeded or transplanted crops, and we write all of this information down into our yearly calendar. These are the basics of crop planning we do on our farm. A great book that helped us a lot with the planning of our production is The Market Gardener by Jean-Martin Fortier. We basically use the same framework explained in that book, but adapted it towards our own context and needs. Step four, prepare your land for production. 
When it comes to preparing your land for the first time, you've got a couple of options. Chances are that when you first start out, you'll likely have to deal with quite some weeds and existing vegetation that you'd like to convert into a production area. And the way you're going to approach it is going to decide whether you're going to be faced with lots of weeding or simple weed management practices down the road. In general terms, there are three main ways you can use, along with some variations, to convert a field of weeds into a production area. Option number one, and probably one of the most familiar ways of preparing your growing area, is cultivating and tilling the soil with a tractor or walk-behind tractor. Just using this option as a standalone method is not recommended. By tilling the soil and plowing it, you will bring up the previously dormant stored weed seeds in the soil and create a perfect environment for these seeds to germinate. I would personally use this approach only in certain circumstances and always in combination with some sort of coverage after the initial tillage to move towards a complete no-till system. Option number two is using a silage tarp to kill off existing vegetation through a process called occultation. And depending on the type of existing vegetation you're dealing with, this tarp will have to be laid down anywhere between 6 to 12 months to be effective. Option number three uses the same principles of depriving the existing vegetation of sunlight, but instead of covering up the ground with a tarp, a thick initial layer of compost is laid down on the surface of the soil without integrating it. This process is called the no-dig approach. Each one has got its pros and cons, and depending on how fast you need your land to be prepared, your budget and your personal preferences, you will have to decide which option you're going to use. On our farm, we actually used a combination of option one and three. Before we arrived on this piece of land, it hadn't been touched much for over 20 years, besides the occasional grazing of a small herd of sheep. As you can imagine, the weeds arrived waist high, and since we needed to get the production going immediately, we didn't have many options. So we decided to do a one-time initial tillage, and from there on, work towards a complete no-till, no-dig system. Now, it is possible to prepare your land in a short time frame by just putting down a four to six inch layer of compost on the soil surface, that will allow to kill off the existing vegetation and will allow you to start growing immediately. But if we would have gone that way, we would have had to invest a large amount of money into this initial coverage with compost, which was not something we were confident with to do at the time. So instead, we opted to plow the land, got rid of most of the roots after it was plowed, created the beds and applied a two to three inch layer of compost on the beds without incorporating it into the soil. We knew that with the initial tillage of the land in combination with just a thin layer of compost, we were going to face quite some weeding and our expectations were definitely met. With consistent weed management, we've been able to get complete control over the area and it's now an important part of our production system. It's important to understand that when you initially prep your soil, you want to achieve two things. One, you want to get rid of the weeds and two, you want to balance the soil. Most of the soils we are working with contain all of the nutrients necessary for good vegetable growth, but the missing link oftentimes is the soil organic matter and soil life. This can quickly be corrected by bringing in lots of compost to start feeding the soil food web that in turn will start taking care of your crops. Once you've prepared your soil and balanced it, it becomes just a matter of keeping the soil fertility maintained by introducing organic matter each year. Step 5. Grow your crops. From preparing your land, we go over to growing your crops. On our farm, we grow crops in two different ways. We start seedlings in the nursery, which we then transplant out into the fields, and we direct seed crops. For each of the methods, we follow a different approach. The transplanted crops on our farm all get started in a dedicated nursery. Here we can tailor towards the needs of the small seedlings and allow them to grow into strong and healthy transplants. For this process, we use simple nursery trays. These trays come in many different sizes and dimensions to suit the needs of the specific crops that are grown in it. We fill up the trays with a high quality pre-made potting soil, but before we fill them up we make sure to moisten the medium a bit, we then fill them up, compact it slightly, seed it, cover the seeds with a final layer of potting soil, water it down and we're done. Depending on the type of crop we are growing, we either transplant these seedlings outside into their final location or in the case of crops like tomatoes, we pot them up into larger pots with fresh new potting soil and we grow them on several weeks longer till chances of frost have passed. At this time we make sure to harden off the transplants to prevent a transplanting shock and let them get used to the outdoor conditions. Just before we transplant them into their final location, we make sure the beds are prepared and are ready to receive the seedlings. Depending on the time of the year, this means that we either broad fork the beds, apply compost and mark out the spacing needed for the crops. Once we've transplanted the crop, we ensure that they're irrigated and kept moist until they've settled in and are taking off. The no-dig style beds on our farm really helps us with the water holding capacity of the soil and keeps the whole area moist without having to irrigate as much. The direct seeding we do on our farm 
takes up a lot less time. For this process we use precision seeders like the Jank seeder and the six row seeder. The six row seeder we use it for all baby leaf crops like salad mixes at a very high density and the Jank seeder for most of our other crops. Unlike with the six row seeder who needs a near perfect bed preparation, the Jank is not as picky as to the way you prepare your beds and does a good job of compacting the beds after seeding. Now every crop is different and different crops need different spacing. For a full list of the crop spacing we use on our farm, you can download our 7 steps to making a living on a small farm guide for free and check out our crop spacing chart along with many other resources. I'll put the link down below in the description so check that out. The way we do the direct seeding with the Jank seeder is simple. Let's say I'm seeding radish and I'm planting 5 rows in a bed. I first plant the two outside rows, then I pass one time exactly in the middle and the remaining two rows I plant in the middle of those two rows. It might take a little bit of practice in the beginning, but it won't be too hard to get the hang of it. As for the six row seeder, we simply make two passes over the bed and we have planted the full bed. Then a quick word about the advantages of transplanted crops over direct seeded crops. On our farm we favor growing transplanted crops. Growing transplants allows us to gain a considerable amount of time which in return allows us to increase our profitability significantly. Take a lettuce head for example. The average days to maturity of this crop is roughly 60 days. But this does not mean that the crop stays 60 days outside in the garden. Instead we grow the lettuce seedlings for roughly 30 days in the nursery before we transplant it out into their final location for another 30 days before we harvest them. This means that within a 60 day period we can potentially harvest two crops of lettuce heads. Now take a direct seeded crops like beetroots from which the days to maturity is roughly the same as a lettuce head. 60 days. In that 60 day time frame you will only have one crop of beetroots versus the two crops of lettuce heads. Besides the gain in time and production you will also plant your transplanted crops at the perfect spacing which means you will get more uniform harvest and potentially more crops out of the same space as opposed to direct seeded crops. Therefore on our farm we favor growing transplanted crops over direct seeded crops. As soon as a bed is harvested, we want to replant that bed as soon as we possibly can with plants that are already several weeks old. This is a great way you can optimize your production system and increase the amount of crops you can produce, but also the profits you can make on a small farm. Now obviously there are crops that don't transplant well or at all, and those will have to be direct seeded. But in general, this is a great way to increase your revenue per growing bed. Step 6. Market and sell your crops. Once you've grown your crops, it's time to sell them to your customers. If you followed step 1 in this tutorial, you notice that the marketing and selling aspect of your crops comes pretty naturally. If you do your homework up front and you do it correctly, you virtually guarantee that you will sell your produce by the time your crops are ready. Since you already know what the estimated demands are with your potential customers by doing the initial market research, the selling part becomes surprisingly simple. Though the way you market and sell your produce depends a lot on the type of customers you are serving. Take a CSA membership for example. The bulk of the marketing of your CSA shares are done during the slow months of the year, before the growing season starts. Usually this is in winter. If you sell your produce on the farmer's market, the marketing and selling will be done on a weekly basis. Same goes for chefs and grocery stores. But no matter what your market streams are, promoting yourself and your farm are an important part in achieving success. The way you present yourself, the way you talk, the promises you make are all important when it comes to marketing and selling. And this all relates back to branding. Your message, the values you stand for, the story of your farm, the name of the farm, the people you serve and the people you don't serve, the way you present your produce, the quality of your produce, all these things combined are what makes up your farm brand and this can play a crucial role in the success of your farm. The best way we can describe a brand is that the brand is the personality of your farm. When doing business with other people, whether you're selling to someone at the local farmer's market, to restaurants or to grocery stores, it is important that they know who they're doing business with and why they're doing business with you. Are you the go-to farm for high quality, locally grown, freshly picked produce or do you sell conventionally lower quality produce? Do you sell your produce in compostable paper bags or do you sell it in plastic bags? The customers you attract are directly related to the way you position yourself as a farm. For example, on our farm we have decided that we don't want to sell any of our crops in plastic packaging. That is a decision we have made and because of that decision we are limited in the types of customers we can serve as well as somewhat limited in the types of crops we grow. But that is what we stand for and is something we don't want to step away from. Because of that decision, 
the main customers that we serve share the same values and principles we have as farmers. Our crops are mainly sold to people that are aware of our current environmental situation and they play their part to try and make it better in a way that resonates the most with them. Now I want to be clear that when you start out you have to find a balance between your ideology and common sense. If you are in an area where organic produce or locally grown produce is something that's not as common and people are not used to it, you might find it hard to get customers and it will take you quite some time to educate them. In that case, serve the existing customers and the local demand with familiar products and grow and educate your customers from there. When done right, a brand can help a lot with the success of your farm business. It clearly delivers your message, which in turn can emotionally connect your customers to you and your produce, and it can create a strong customer loyalty. So it's definitely worth it to take some time analyzing your market, look at what your competitors are doing, find out who your potential customers are, and find ways to differentiate yourself and position yourself in your market. Step seven, keep track of everything. One of the most important steps if you want to achieve success with farming is to keep track of everything. Create basic spreadsheets for your farm, whether it's crop production related or sales related. Having basic spreadsheets for your farm is a must. This was one of my biggest mistakes when I first started out. I was pretty overwhelmed with all the things that had to be done on the farm that at the end of the day, I neglected this crucial part. Big mistake. If you want to know how much yield you get from a bed, what input you have per bed, whether it's seed, compost, labor or anything else, you've got to keep records of it if you want to know that what you do is profitable, efficient and even worth it. I know it's not the most interesting part of farming, but it sure is really crucial for decision making and future planning of the farm. Take the time to sit down a couple of hours per week analyzing your data. This will really help you get a better understanding of the functioning of your farm. You might realize that the crop is not as profitable as you thought, or you might realize that you can plant your crops a bit denser than you've been doing. Whether you need to know what you've actually sold throughout the growing season or the days to maturities of the crops you've grown over the years. Having recordings of all this data will allow you to continuously improve your farm each year. Now, if you like this video, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel right now. Also, if you want to get more information on how you can actually quit your job, start a farm and make a living from it, head over to thedutchfarmer.com and download our free guide in which I share the exact same step-by-step -step process that allows us to make a good living on our farm. I'll put the link down below in the description. Now, let me know in the comment section below. Which of the steps did you actually like the most? As always, thanks for watching, have a nice day and see you in the next video.